Hi, we continue in 1 Samuel 13 today, and we're going to be looking at the five verses 13, 11 to 15. On the right side of the screen, you can see the yellow box right here where Samuel confronts Saul. Um, in these few verses, uh, there's so much ambiguity and so many issues that arouse scholars to argue every which way about uh, what is going on here. I'm reminded as I was watching last night of my wife Sue, uh, the last one of the last episodes of the great AMC show Better Call Saul. And after I watch a show like that in the morning when I'm taking my dog for a walk, I like to listen to a podcast and hear what people think about it. And when I looked it up, there were 11 podcasts on season six of Better Call Saul, which is to say good literature generates conversation. Uh, and a lot of that is ambigu intentional ambiguity, where the motivations of characters and exactly what's going on is clear enough to generate conversation, but not so unclear that people throw up their hands, uh, but also not so clear that there's nothing to talk about because everything's been shown. And I think that's a lot of what's going on here. Scholars can think it's a matter of different sources of pro and anti-monarchy or pro and anti or anti-Saul, and maybe that's the case. But the final product we have here in this chapter is a fabulous example of ambiguity of characterization and the theology that comes from that uh, and has generated an enormous amount of scholarly uh, debate and differences. Um, I want to start, before we look at the verses, with just uh, some of scholarly thoughts on this, just to get an idea of the range of things. So um, this is just from a few scholars, and the issue, of course, is that Samuel um, confronts Saul and challenges him with violating the commandments of Yahweh your God. Uh, and it's allegedly connected with three chapters before when he issued um, this command after he had issued the uh, statement about a number of signs that he would, that Saul would see prophets on the road and join them, which we saw back then. Um, but those all happened the same day as Saul told them, and this one didn't. So it, what he said was, you shall go down to Gilgal ahead of me, then I will come down to you to present burnt offerings and offer sacrifices of well-being. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. This can be parsed like a lawyer, although it's not legislation, it's simply an oral statement from one person to another. Notice that Yahweh isn't mentioned anywhere in there, but that doesn't stop scholars from assuming, sometimes, that this is Yahweh's command. So let's look at just a range of some of the scholarly views, if we can stimulate our own thinking as we begin to look at these passages. So first from Walter Brueggemann, he notes, Samuel cites no commandment that has been broken, nor can we construe one. The commandment that seems to have been broken is, thou shalt not violate Samuel's authority. Similarly, David Jobling here notes, his real obligation is simply to do nothing without Samuel, without Samuel showing him what to do. Uh, and I won't read the whole quote here, uh, but I'll, going down to the last part here is, he judges Saul, that is, the situation and takes action. He acts as a king acts, but his doing so brings Samuel back quick, as opposed to dead, because Jobling's making a play on the fact that uh, Samuel's late now in the sense of behind time, and it'll be late later in the sense of dead. Albert Saul and Holmes, who are not biblical scholars, but political theorists and commentators, note this. What the author of Samuel conveys by this striking episode is how religion, even when sincerely believed, can be instrumentalized in power struggles and how political rivals can shed, their mor shed moral qualms about treating the sacred as just another weapon to be opportunistically deployed in the competitive struggle for prestige and power. That's quite a sentence, but notice how it's taken out of the realm of characterization there and, and plot and into the larger realm of the relation to religion and, and political power. Uh, Keith Bodner, a couple of quotes from him here, um, reviewing various views like the ones I've just shown you and others on what Saul did wrong, concludes, the central judgment of chapter 13 falls on kingship as an institution. So he sees it not about the character Saul and Samuel so much as about the larger picture of kingship, much as how Saul and Holmes see it about the larger question of power and religion. Um, Bodner also notes here, just as Samuel is unable to form a hereditary judgeship, we recall because his sons were corrupt, they took bribes, so Saul does not have the prospect of an enduring royal house, a certainty that is ironically underscored by means of the early introduction of Jonathan in this very chapter without any genealogical reference to his father. The point here, in a nutshell, is that Saul will not be allowed to choose his successor. So Bodner shifts the emphasis here to the succession issue, not kingship as an institution as such, or Saul as a character, but the question of whether monarchy, unlike judgeship or prophecy, will be allowed to be a dynasty passed on from father to son. 
Uriah Kim, another uh, scholar of these books, notes, um, the narrative casually ignores the fact that many years have passed since Saul's selection as king, and the event in chapter 13 and does nothing between Saul's selection as king and the event in chapter 13, and does nothing to decrease the gravity of Saul's failure to obey, obey Samuel's last instruction from 10.8. Notice that Kim there is assuming that, that Saul's failure is grave here, um, but as we look at, uh, people can disagree about that. Diana Edelman notes this, do verses 13 and 14 represent a legitimate prophetic pronouncement expressing Yahweh's will, or are they instead Samuel's warning to Saul about his possible future divine rejection in light of his failure to obey the earlier directions from 10.8? Um, in other words, is it about Yahweh? Is it about Samuel? Um, or is it about a future element of Yahweh that's not here? Um, uh, Fockelman, the structuralist critic, notes, Saul's speech is characterized by completeness and clarity. Saul here appears as someone who is soundly explaining his motives in verse 11 and his decision-making in verse 12 and has nothing to hide. Samuel may think that Saul has failed the test, but the narrator betrays no trace of any attitude of judgment or cheap superiority over the doomed king. So, as you can see, Fockelman thinks that Saul is doing the best he can and there's no reason to criticize him at all. It's just Samuel's problem here. Um, Robert Polson notes this, and Robert Polson, one of the initiators of literary reading of these books. Uh, it is not difficult to see Samuel's subsequent accusation of the king as a trumped-up charge to keep Saul on the defensive and under his prophetic control. He goes on to say that 13, 1 to 15 are thus about Samuel's present failure as prophet as well as Saul's future failures as king. In other words, he sees that Saul has not done anything wrong yet, but he will later. But it's Samuel who's failed as prophet um, on a number of grounds that, that pulls in notes, not least of which he didn't complete his own promise to show up on time. Finally, uh, for, for now at least, from Paul Borgman, we have this. The audience might be expected to feel sympathy were it not for what the narrative has already established regarding the king's striking fearfulness. Saul's character flaw, it appears, is not so much the wrongdoing, but a habit of the heart that leads to the wrongdoing. In other words, he sees it as not a matter of a legal argument about whether Saul actually followed the word of Samuel's, or is it Yahweh's command, but something wrong with Saul in his heart at the, at the center of who he is, and this is simply an example, the situation brings that out. So what are we to do with that wide range of views? The best I think we can do is enter into the text, and you can decide for yourselves using some of those to guide us, um, but putting them aside if the text leads us in another direction. So let's jump right in. So we recall we left off last time with Saul going out to meet Samuel and blessing him. It says salute him here. Notice that it's Saul going out to meet him. So Saul takes the initiative. He's not afraid of Samuel's presence. He doesn't sound like he's guilty or has anything to hide. Um, he's not uh, like we'll see when we already saw when he when they were searching for the king and he was hiding among the baggage, apparently not wanting to be selected as king. But here he seems to be eager to go meet Saul and he goes out to bless him. And so we hear this. Samuel said, what have you done? Literally, what have you made? And if you've been watching the videos in this section, you recall, and I posted on the website, um, a chart showing how the, the verb um, asa here in Hebrew, um, to make, is uh, very common in chapter 12, and it's several times here, often lost in translation. So Samuel asks, what have you made? Um, note there, by making it made and not done, it's not about a specific action, but about a creating of something. And from that perspective, it's an interesting question. What has Saul made? In other words, has he made a monarchy? Has he made a battle plan? Um, and Saul replied. Now, before we look at Saul's reply, let's just remember the context here. Because in these verses, even the part you can see on the screen there, down to verse 14, there's nothing about what's going on all around them, which is the muster of Philistines, as many as the sand of the sea, um, surrounding them, ready to attack. And as we'll see in the, at the end of this section, Saul, when he counts his soldiers, is down to 600 soldiers. The Philistines have 6,000 charioteers and 3,000 chariots, not to mention a countless number of uh, uh, regular armed soldiers. And they control weapons, as we'll see in a few verses too. The narrator tells that, but obviously the characters... Uh, uh, already know that. And so, in, in other words, we're in a desperate situation. That's what Saul was doing, was seeking Yahweh's favor, as we'll see him claim in a moment. And Samuel isn't concerned, apparently, with anything about the Israelites' fate under the Philistines or the urgency of coming with a battle plan. Rather, he's here to castigate Saul for an apparent violation of some kind of command, his own or Yahweh's, uh, as we'll see. 
So let's look at Saul's defense here uh, in response to Samuel's, what have you made? Notice that right now it's not a, a charge, it's not an accusation, it's simply a question. Um, although, given what we've seen already of Samuel um, trying to control Saul, we can certainly feel a hostility there, even if it's not expressed literally in the words. So Saul replies, and let's look at it carefully. When I saw that the people were slipping away from me, and we noticed last time, uh, the word for slipping away. This is a different word here. And the basic meaning is to shatter, um, which has an interesting rhyme in English with scatter, but is not the direct meaning of it. Um, so in the Septuagint, it's just diaspare, which is to, to scatter something. Uh, but it's a rare word here, so different than the earlier word that's associated with exile for slipping away in the previous passage. But this is what Saul sees. He sees the people are slipping away, understandably terrified, uh, being so grossly outnumbered by the Philistines. They may be slipping away from Saul, or they may be just hiding from the battle. It seems to be a suicide. So it's not clear if they're distrusting Saul's leadership or just counting the numbers and it looks bad to them. Um, Saul has not consulted the people at this point. So when he saw the people slipping away and that you did not come within the days appointed, which is what the narrator clearly made um, uh, plain to us, that seven days had been appointed and the, Saul waited the seven days and then Samuel wasn't there. So two things, the people were slipping away, Samuel didn't come, and the Philistines are mustering at Michmash. So all those things are happening, and then Saul, we hear his thoughts out loud. Here it says he said, um, this is plainly to himself, because it wasn't narrated earlier, and we don't hear now that he's saying to anybody else. So it's just his thinking out loud. Now the Philistines will come down upon me. And this is the first hint we get that Saul is turning into somebody who's afraid for himself. Um, in chapter 11, we call with the Ammonites, we recall him, sorry, with the Ammonites, he acted the perfect judge. He ordered uh, people to come. He won the battle. He refused to kill those who grumbled, had grumbled against him before the battle. And he gave Yahweh the credit. So just two chapters ago, he was the perfect judge. But now, confronted by Samuel, um, he's getting to be worried about himself. And, and one point that people could make is, perhaps Saul's downfall is simply being harassed by Samuel. Perhaps Samuel has uh, broken Saul's confidence and led him to feel insecure, and we'll see more of that uh, as we go. It'll eventually lead to Yahweh doing something seemingly unimaginable to people raised with a New Testament kind of theology, which is to send an evil spirit on Saul. But that's not the case yet. Right now, Saul, last time we saw, had the spirit of Yahweh upon him to lead the battle, and nothing said it went away. Um, so here we are, um, concerned about himself. The Philistines will come down upon me at Gilgal, and we have, remember where we are here at Gilgal in this battle scene, and I have not entreated the favor of the Lord or Yahweh. Um, we see that verb for not entreated um, several times, but it, it more or less means in the PL form that we see here to be weak or sick. It's not a normal word for entreating, of asking the favor of somebody. Um, so it's an unusual word there. It's hard to imagine um, how else we might interpret that, since most translations do render it something like that. Um, but it's a strange word for that. So I've not entreated the favor of Yahweh. Was he supposed to? We looked last time at examples from judges where people offered burnt offerings and, and offerings of well-being and then in, um, sought Yahweh's favor in the book of Judges. So um, if he knows that story, whether he won't know the book of Judges, but if he knows those stories, and we're supposed to assume he does, I think, because the audience certainly is expected to know them. Um, there's no reason to think Saul wouldn't. Um, that he's doing what judges are supposed to do. Um, uh, and yet, even then, he says, so I forced myself, uh, a rare word here, only two other times in narrative outside, um, outside this passage here, both in Genesis. So he forced himself and offered the burnt offering. So before we hear Samuel's response, let's listen carefully again to what Saul um, said his defense was. The people were slipping away. Samuel broke his promise and didn't come. The Philistines were mustering in huge numbers. He reasonably understands the Philistines will now come down upon me or us. And without the, knowing the favor of Yahweh, he doesn't know if he should go into battle or run. Um, and isn't that what a king should do, is entreat the favor of Yahweh before they go off to, go off to war? But let's scroll up a, a little bit so we can see the rest of our passage and hear how Samuel responds. Samuel says to fall, Saul, fool! And literally in Hebrew, niskalta, one word for the first four, fool or foolish. Um, 
you're a fool or you're foolish. Um, we'll see how that's related to Nabal later, um, the person uh, who's, who dies under David's uh, uh, threat later in uh, 1 Samuel. Uh, Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly or you're foolish. You, um, here, and notice how this is going to be framing here, you have not kept the command of the Lord and you have not kept the, what the Lord commanded. So it's not exactly a chiasm, but it is framing that with emphasis there. Um, but we have to ask, what command of Yahweh your God? Um, you know, there is no explicit command. We The only reference is back to 10.8. Some have argued that 10.8 is so long ago, not just in the text, but in chronology, that Saul shouldn't be expected to be playing that one out. But he is playing it out. He did remember that. Um, and yet Samuel broke it. So um, what commandment hasn't he kept? Uh, and that leads people like Brueggemann to say the commandment is the commandment of, uh, to obey Samuel. Um, so you've not kept the commandment of your God, um, emphasizing that there. Saul will put it back on Samuel in their second and final confrontation in chapter 15. Therefore, Yahweh would, would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. And let me move up my note paint a little bit because there are a couple of important issues here. The word takon, as Brueggemann notes, never is announced until this moment of rejection. But as Jobling notes about the Hebrew, and I won't bring up the Hebrew details here, but he says there's no reason why we should not simply read, just now Yahweh established your kingdom, as opposed to would have established your kingdom. Um, if we heard as Jobling has it, we'd hear, just now Yahweh has established your kingdom, but now your kingdom will not continue. Um, but how does Samuel know that, um, that Yahweh has established his kingdom? Yahweh has actually not been very involved in this kingship of Saul much at all. He we will be in the un, un, undermining of it um, pretty soon, and we'll see that later. But he's not, Yahweh is not in this scene directly at all. And how does Samuel know that? Um, that would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. It would have established a dynasty, as Nathan will promise David, famously in 2 Samuel 7. Um, that one isn't true either, um, but it's certainly what led people hundreds of years later to expect an anointed one, which is to say a Messiah like David, who would liberate uh, the people in Jerusalem and the environs from the Romans. Um, and we know where that story leads. So Samuel is offering this, and many readers, both readers of the text and scholarly readers, have assumed that this is the word of Yahweh. But as we saw from Diana Edelman's uh, quote, maybe it is and maybe it's not. Um, because Samuel has not been that been perfectly faithful in reporting Yahweh's words uh, or back and forth. Um, Yahweh commanded Samuel to listen to the people, but he doesn't want to listen to the people. Um, he wants to be the person who's the official Yahweh designate, um, and he's losing his post. So he continues here. But now, and um, it doesn't have to be but here. Um, it could be simply and now. Um, your kingdom will not continue. As Falkelman notes below, uh, without getting the technicalities here of the grammar, he says, it is precisely Yahweh who is absent in verse 14a only, and this expresses how Saul is abandoned by God. Maybe, or maybe it's how Samuel's been abandoned by God. Yahweh's not talking to Samuel either. Uh, that Samuel may just be going off on his own, like we see countless people proclaiming that God is on their side, but there's little evidence to uh, support it other than their own views. So again, I want to emphasize that Samuel is looking no better in this scene than Saul. It's just he's the one um, powering it forward, and, and people tend to follow the person that's powering it forward as opposed to the person who is being powered over. So he continues here, but now your kingdom will not continue, um, will not literally will not stand, um, as Bodner notes in my note below, in a reversal of royal primogeniture akin to the pattern in Genesis, Saul fails just like any firstborn son, which is to say, as we'll see, uh, that Esau, uh, in, the, in the Genesis series, Esau is before Jacob, but clearly Jacob gets the blessing and birthright and everything else that flows from it, similarly with uh, Ishmael and Isaac. Um, so here it's reversed. Uh, so, and here is a controversial uh, sentence that uh, we'll look at more as we go when we get to David. But here we hear for the first time, Yahweh has sought a man after his own heart. And um, the verb for sought here is different than the verb for, uh, for choose. As Edelman notes, um, should we take this as, without looking again at the grammatical technicalities, as completed acts or as perfects, as something that will happen? In other words, here in English, it's past tense. Has Yahweh already sought or is it Yahweh will seek 
someone because what does Samuel know about someone else? Um, when it comes time to be the next person, who of course is David, Samuel doesn't know it's David. In fact, Samuel's first choice is one of David's older brothers. Um, so Samuel plainly doesn't know, and we've not seen narrated anything where Yahweh has expressed his dissatisfaction to Samuel about Saul yet, although we'll see that in, in chapter 15. Um, the controversy is over this after his own heart. We already saw that Yahweh gave Saul another heart, but that's a different thing. And uh, let's look at the two quotes from my notes that might help us out here. As Bodner notes, it is often thought that this phrase has to do with some special inner quality. However, a number of recent scholars have compared other uses of this phrase and note the emphasis here lies with God's freedom in regards to matters of election. And Rochelle Gilmore uh, adds this too, that the phrase, according to his heart, analogizing from 2 Samuel 7, the passage I was just noting, where Nathan tells David that um, someone from David's family, uh, household, um, will be on the throne forever. Um, so Rochelle Gilmore saying, uh, who argues that this phrase, according to his heart, has an affective dimension, in contrast with the um, with the verb choose, which is in 1024. So the issue is not according to God's heart, and thus Saul is chosen, but not favored. That um, chosen does not mean favored, but according to heart, or seeking according to the heart, means someone that God favors. But it's not about the person who selected his heart. That's what's key here that scholars have noted. It's not about what will become David's heart. Um, it's not to say David's heart and Yahweh's heart are the same. It's to say there's something about in Yahweh's heart that uh, finds David attractive. And we'll see how that's the case. We'll see how it says Yahweh loves David, but it never says that David y loves Yahweh. Nor does it ever say that David loves anybody at all. Um, so uh, we'll see that there's something about David that Yahweh and everybody else seems drawn to, but Yahweh is not drawn to Saul, according to Samuel at least. And yet Yahweh has appointed him, again, as if it's already happened when plainly it hasn't. And when we get to it in chapter 16 and 17, we'll see in many ways David is made king three different ways. Uh, appointed him not to be a king, but to be a nagid, what was the original um, status of, of Saul. And again, we don't really know what that is. Here it's translated ruler, sometimes it's translated prince. Prince is plainly wrong because this is not the son of a king, the obvious successor, which is what prince implies, but simply a ruler who's not a king. And so a generic word like ruler is used because Nagid doesn't really have a parallel um, in English uh, for someone who's a ruler, but, but not what we think of as a king. Um, and so it's suggesting that perhaps there will be no more kings. Um, that that Saul's kingdom will not continue and a nugget will be put instead of a king. But again, that's not what will happen. So Samuel is wrong about that and, and all readers will see that. And Saul has no response. We'll see a long response from Saul after the Amalekite issue in chapter 15. But Saul has nothing. We don't know if he's sad, if he's angry, if he's disturbed, if he's shocked, if he thought he'd done well and, uh, and he's shocked at this. And there's not a word. And so all we hear is Samuel left and went on his way from Gilgal. There's some technical issues here in the Hebrew and the Greek of whether it's Saul who's going uh, with the army from uh, Gilgal to Gibeah or Samuel. The Hebrew has one and the Greek has the other. That doesn't matter too much for our purpose now. We're just talking about this distance here. Gibeah is Saul's hometown and Gilgal is where they just were. Um, and meanwhile, the rest of the people followed Saul to join the army. They went up from Gilgal toward Gibeah of Benjamin, and Saul counted the people who were present with him, about 600 men. The verb for counted is one that will come back to haunt David at the very end of 2 Samuel when he orders a census, which is basically what's happening here, a census of the army. And uh, David will be harshly chastised for that, but uh, Saul is not chastised for that. So Yahweh doesn't come down on him for this or for anything else here. But what he faces as this scene unfolds is not only the psychological shock of, of being undermined by Samuel, but having to face into the infinite, seemingly infinite army of the Philistines with 600 soldiers. We'll see what happens then next time. See you then. Bye-bye.